assembled in panel formation, and this is solely to give me the opportunity to sit in this chair. So, uh, welcome. We have a panel, as you can see, entitled Profiling, Personalization, and Prediction. What about principles, privacy, and protection? So to just recap the description that you've got in the, the program, data aggregation, user profiling, behavioral prediction, technology allows us to do all of these things to the benefit of enhancing services, personalizing the user experience, and refining the things that businesses can offer to customers. In addition, similar core technologies can also be used in security monitoring and threat intelligence. However, as data collection and profiling technologies advance, are we losing track of the privacy and ethical issues that are involved? And is the data itself receiving sufficient protection in terms of security? So, in order to debate this issue alongside yourselves, who I hope will be very participative and didn't eat too much that so you're all going to be quiet now, we've got two regular panellists and a newbie on this side. So we have in, we'll go in this order, we've got John Finch, the Information Governance Manager from Plymouth City Council and our co-host for the event today. John's responsible for data protection, security policy development and management, managing security incidents and providing security awareness and education. John's a current CISP and undertook a master's degree at the University of Plymouth back in 2001, which we always tend to mention, um, and he did his thesis on approaches to establishing IT security culture. Next we have Pete Woodward from Securus, one of our sponsors today. Pete's a co-founder of Securus, um, a cyber security compliance company that's based in the Science Park up in Exeter. He's worked on security projects in the public and private sectors for organisations including Devon and Cornwall Police, the Met Office, CAPTA, BP, HP and some of the UK's largest retailers. And he also co-founded the Southwest Cyber Security Cluster to raise awareness of issues within the region. And last but not least, this side of me, we have Andy Fippin, Professor of Social Responsibility in IT at the University of Plymouth. Um, Andy's research interests lie in the exploration of the use of technology in relationships, online safety, digital resilience, and the ethical and professional practices in the IT sector. Andy's worked with ethical and social responsibility in a variety of ways, including how technology impacts the social world, and including work with companies such as BT, Google, and Facebook. So between them, they should have a fair degree of expertise to answer the questions that I shall pose, because I've got a few written down as a, a little bit of a starter, and then we'll open the floor up to yourselves and uh, see what you have to ask them. So, <coughs> panel. Um, based on the, the description, there's all this profiling, prediction, etc., and the privacy issues, do you feel you're the beneficiary or a victim of the profiling, personalization, and prediction aspects? So who wants to jump in first? And when you jump in, you need to press your little sleep button. Okay, first. Um, so a beneficial victim of a profile personalization it really depends on the context. Um, there's some services that I, I get, for example, I subscribe to Sky, they send me offers relative to me. I'm happy with that because I actually subscribe to that. But when I'm on a, a random website and things are popping up from other websites, that's almost like a um, victim scenario. So it really depends on the context. And in reality, it's becoming part of modern life that you are being profiled constantly. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to, to say I'm, I'm, I feel quite beneficial from some of the uh, predictive technology and, and data um, systems that are out there at the moment. It's only if I'm looking for family holidays, etc. We put in a search and we come back with um, some you know, accurate results and timeframes, etc. for going away. Um, in terms of uh, Recent events, I was at home the other day searching on my laptop in the, in the same environment, home environment for something random bloke thing and, and the wife opened up her, her, her website and uh, all the adverts, that are the, the subject I was looking at actually popped up on her screen as well, so there's nothing naughty, it's all, all legit. <laughs> It could, could be um, quite interesting and, and quite... Ross, awesome. can you confirm it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, most like related. So, you know, it was, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, and um, to be fair, I think um, that, that's certainly on the increase, and um, it's, it's almost like I'm being profiled as well now when I'm going online. Like there's, there's um, regular websites, look at BBC News, etc. These sort of sites, and, and they're they're almost being 
auto fed into into my search engines and um, almost predicting what I'm actually going to look for. So it's quite a scary thing. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, pretty much the same as, as everyone else. Really, I think it's balance. Um, uh, obviously, we do draw benefit from these sorts of things. Um, otherwise, we'd probably be less accepting of them. But my concerns are really around where we've got less chance of consent. So when you start to see law enforcement using biometric systems in the street, those sorts of things. So Notting Hill Carnival was a wonderful example of the use of face recognition in a public place where um, two young ladies were pulled over because they looked like a black criminal they were looking for and things like that. So uh, you do sort of question the, well, I'm sure I'm going to come back to this again and again. It's, it's as effective as the people who understand how to deploy it. Things. So, I think when we get into things, when we get into talking around things like artificial intelligence and things more, I think it's sometimes viewed as the universal silver sort of bullet for everything by people that don't really understand the underlying technology. So let, let's chuck some more AI at something, it will be better then. Um, I think we are at risk of some end prisoner closed type situation. Equally, if you do understand how these sorts of things work, you can start to then copy the algorithm. So, uh, I also buy for, for my children on Amazon, so I get some very interesting recommendations and things come up all the time. Um, I might just be doing that for a while, uh, equally. Some of my comments on Facebook um, do result in me getting some very bizarre adverts. But that's just, it amuses me more than it concerns me. Okay. And, and, and also you need to think about how the profile is conducted. So there's um, evidence that certain types of phones are listening to conversations and people reporting they, they've spoken about a certain thing um, completely independent of being on the internet and suddenly the searches for those things um, start appearing so it's the degree of profiling and, and the um, intrusion on people's uh, lives that is probably a key thing that is not yet understood. Can I pick up on that one as well? Um, I, I did a lecture on this the other day um, suggesting that there might be some people that wish to wear foil hats about this sort of thing sometimes. And I talked about everyone believes the device to listen to them and things. And a student came up to me after and said, yeah, I wouldn't believe that until three months ago. But um, I, I met with a mentor um, uh, a couple of days ago and um, we'd never met before. I only knew his, his first name. And then the next day he was recommended to me on Facebook. So we all had a little bit of a do-do-do moment. And then I said, hang on a minute, you use um, Microsoft email at this university, don't you? Yeah. So have you emailed it? Yeah. Well, that's probably more likely than isn't it in terms of mass sharing your data than your phone listening to you and then profiling you and then making Facebook suggestions back at you. Oh yeah, that may be the case. So I think particularly when we're looking at environments where we outsource, I mean the university. Remember the old days where we used to give students back a 20 million box <laughs> and posted them ourselves? It's all they needed. Who would ever need more than 20 million? Um, uh, these days we, we outsource it to Microsoft and, and obviously Microsoft are a lovely bunch of people who do this out the kindness of their heart. Um, accessing massive amounts of data. Oh, no, not at all. Just that prompt any questions or questions already from the audience? Yes, we have one from Nick there. Uh, just a possibly even more likely scenario there is that one of the two attendees has an Android phone they put the appointment in their Android thing and listed the other person as the person they were going to yeah. meet and then shared that way. So, yeah. so I think there is a, an aspect that people don't necessarily appreciate or understand the ways that the data could be shared. And so it has that immediate potential to seem spooky um, if, if you're not actually keeping on track of how the things interact. We've got another hand over there, yes, James. Just very quickly, what are some of the things that you guys do reduce your profile and your ability to be tracked, so Tor browser, VPN, things like that. What's the things that you do at home to try and reduce that? Um, to be honest with you, very little, um, unless um, I, some of the work I do is, is around um, children's use of pornography and those sorts of things. Um, I don't particularly do that on university campus um, because that does raise some interesting alerts and things. But, but really, it's if, if you were to see my Facebook profile, you might see a, a horrifically satirical version of me. And I think that's one way where I'm, it keeps the algorithms guessing as far as Facebook is concerned. But, but I, I am aware of, of the things we can use and occasionally we'll use them. But, but equally, it's kind of like the, uh, the restitution is like, okay, is it serious enough for me to do this? Um, 
um, and most of the time I kind of think oh, I'll, I'll ride with it. Um, but yeah, uh, sometimes I just think of things where probably the university wouldn't like to see some of the search terms that, that I have to go across and those sorts of things. And I don't particularly want that phone call from IT services either. Um, so I want to do those away from the university campus and stuff. And um, so I mean, I've got social media profiles locked down pretty tightly. Um, there's no pictures um, that are publicly available. But when it comes to general browsing, very little. I mean, if somebody wants to look at my history, it's generally Wikipedia, Facebook, and BBC Sport, which um, is it, it, quite dull. So I don't have to be taking precautions there. Um, but when it comes to the likes of social media, yeah, that is something that I take quite seriously and try and lock down and turn off uh, personalised advertising and various things like that. Um, for us, it's, it's a home network, so it's not a trick is it, to security? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, no. Um, and obviously, work-related uh, is via multi factor leak down into the office if we need to, um, antivirus, <coughs> all, the, all the usual controls, um, parental controls on the, the internet provided, um, router, firewall, all that lockdown. Um, I think I'm probably I'm, I'm okay to say that I'm not that great with things like Xbox and, and the gaming stuff that our 12 year old son works with. We've obviously disabled all his um, single sign on and um, authentication to buy more games, etc. That's all locked down, I know about that. But um, in terms of it's plugged in, it's, it, it's normally switched off and unless it's playing on it. But um, I, it's, it drives me crazy even some of these pop ups it gets from people that. Um, that may be connecting with him, and, and we've got it locked down as best as, as I understand it. But, um, who, but he's, he's wising up to this. He said, Oh, that's AI, Dad, don't worry about it. I thought, oh, okay, who, who are you racing against now? Oh, it's AI. Okay. <laughs> you know, so there's still, a, there's still a learning curve for, for even adults and parents to, to understand the real risk behind that because obviously the, the, the vendors of Microsoft, Xbox, Nintendo, and all those will just push it straight down the line and say, You know, you need to be connected, it's a global playground now. So, you know, we've got to be really. Um, diligent on that, and I'm, I'm first to say I'm not totally 100% up to speed with all that, so that's where we And then one further precaution I make is um, I've been contacting constantly for the last year about getting a smart meter. I've been refusing one of those until I can get the assurances that um, one is totally secure when it in, in <coughs> the my network, and actually they can guarantee what they're doing with the data and the um, information it's collecting. Talk about some of those things you do, but what about your browsers that you use? So Google Chrome is massive, and when you look at what it's doing in the background, it's tracking where it's sending data. Do you do anything in terms of looking at that, restrictions of that, moving to something like Mozilla and, and Privacy Bill? Yeah, I personally use Safari. Yeah, but Safari is uh, the prime browser under Safari is Google, and Google pay Apple 12 billion dollars a year to get the rights, but the tracking that Google can do under Safari is limited because Apple don't allow third party trackers unilaterally. And the biggest problem is going to be Android. Android is an open platform and the Chinese vendors are putting in apps that look are totally benign, but they are monitoring everything you're doing. So the Chinese state is tracking a lot more than Google is doing. So Android is vulnerable for all the Chinese devices. And that's not just China, there are many other states involved as well. Yeah. <laughs> any more questions from the audience? <coughs> yes. Um, you haven't mentioned location data. Um, mm -hmm. All of our smartphones track pretty much where we are 24-7. Um, I know you can turn off location services, but then you don't get convenience like Google Maps and things like that. I was just thinking about your Facebook thing. I've had friends, I'm sure that Facebook does some sort of geo-matching as well. You've spent a lot of time in close proximity to such and such, therefore you must know them. Um, what, do you, what do you feel about the kind of location, kind of privacy thing, where it's just, if you go on, Google's got the thing where you can look at, it, it can tell you where you've been, and that's a slightly creepy kind of realisation when you see that, um, so what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you feel about that? Certainly from, from my perspective, location services are personally a step too far. I spend a lot of time talking to children who are tracked by their parents and things, and I just, 
turned my stomach a little bit um, because the parents are being sold out when they're being told you, you can reassure yourself that your child is safe now. Mm -hmm. Jamie Oliver very famously was splashed all over the press saying this was a fantastic idea. Um, then I speak to uh, young adults and students who are then trapped by their partners in relationships because they become accepting of it. And then if you look at domestic violence guidance, if you look at new sensitive guidance, GPS tracking is evidence of um, coercion in domestic abuse. Um, so we seem to be, well, I could spend the next afternoon on, on kids <laughs> and rights, but, um, but we seem to be driving a generation that's accepting this sort of thing. I, I will generally switch off a lot of location based tracking. I can remember a conversation I had with my other half many years ago where she thought I was in Plymouth rather than Felmouth because Facebook said I was in Plymouth. I was actually at the university campus or a university building. Um, in Cornwall, however, the IP address range was the same as what we And she got very, I wouldn't say annoyed, but perturbed that I claimed that I was in um, Cornwall and Facebook was saying I was in Plymouth. You know, those sorts of things aren't necessarily that accurate. Um, yeah, but you know, I, I speak to some adults and remember having a conversation with someone a while ago, oh, Ken's late for the meeting, hang on, he's about five minutes away. Do we really need that level of information? I think just like, phone them up or wait another five minutes or something. So, so I find the location stuff quite unpleasant because I think there's a massive erosion of rights around privacy and that's it. And we all go, oh, this is fantastic, isn't it? Brilliant. You know, the, my, my rebuttal to Jamie Oliver was, well, if you can see your daughter's in Reading and then her push can move very quickly in the opposite direction, how does that reassure she's safe? Or what if that push can disappears? What to do then? Call, call the police. My daughter's disappeared from Google Maps. <laughs> it's, it's not about safety. It's always about fake reassurance. And, and no, no matter saying to Andy, I'll only get my default is not to enable location services on apps, but uh, some some is very beneficial too. Um, for example, in a city bus, they've got location services on the buses. So you can actually track where the buses are in real time, which is very very useful. Um, uh, there are other aspects, so uh, we have um, members of staff in the council that are mobile, they've been given mobile devices, and one of the key questions we've got asked is that these can track people, are you going to be using this to track and, and monitor people's performance and, and verify where they are? And we actually had to uh, switch these services off uh, in some cases because there was concerns over privacy and the ethics of all this information could be useful management information. But um, generally, most of it, I, I will turn off, but I use things like um, Strava to track um, sort of uh, cycling or um, walking and things like that. I will purposely not enable it until I'm a suitable distance away from the house because you go back to the um, scenario that happened on an American base where people were able to identify where American military bases were due to the um, perimeter being used by people running with Strava. So um, th there's definitely detrimental impact on location services, but as long as you use them sensibly and make an informed decision. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. You know, that question, I find it creepy, but as a society, are we all happy with that? I don't know. It's just one of those things. I mean, if, if the data is used um, in the context of the good, then, you know, someone, some research could develop um, shoes or footpaths and that because humans, tracking humans, they will walk up between half and one miles an hour and hence the reason, you know, the slopes can be on this way. You know, there's all sorts of benefit you can get from tracking uh, people, obviously all the bad things that, you, that go along with it as well, but you think about uh, demographics in Devon Cornwall, for example, and country lanes, if you have an accident, you can be tracked almost quite well, very easily by emergency services if you, if you actually lose contact with you in a car, for example. So there's some good to come out of that, you know, certain tracking um, applications and things. I don't see, personally, I don't see how we can get away from it because I'm not big enough to tell the likes of Google, etc., to say, stop tracking me. I keep saying no, but you keep doing it. How on earth am I going to push up the, the, the chain to, to get legislation changed, etc., to do that? I have, um, we are going along the, uh, the lines of cladding our house with number plates, that's in where we can get ourselves off Google. <laughs> Apparently, by um, masking the house that way, but uh, yeah, apart from that, there's, there's, there's not a lot we can do about it. And I think as a society, we've got to come to terms with this is happening. We, how do we prevent it? I don't know. It's a real tricky one. Yes, uh, Steve um, and panel. I think there is a point we forget about tracking. We're currently tracked 
with our mobile phones. The HLR on cell handover is dependent on cell volume. And as we move up the scale towards 5G, we will be in microsims. Mm -hmm. So we'll be tracked to tens and hundreds of meters. So if you switch off your smart device, location devices, it makes no difference. My car has a dedicated SIM. When I have an accident, an accelerometer sends an SOS <coughs> signal. It gives my coordinates to the rescue people. Your phone generates an ICE in case of emergency for the police. So I don't think you should be hung up about location services. It's good and it's bad. I use location services a lot when I'm walking the southwest coast path because I want to know where is a taxi where is a bus? Should I walk back or sh can I wait for a bus? In Cornwall, bus services are pretty abysmal <coughs> at the weekend. So I use my app to tell me what buses are running from where I am and how far I've got to walk to the bus stop. Is it quicker to walk back? And I've got GPS track on my phone. I've got GPS tracker on my Garmin. So location services are very good if you need to use them. If the problem is, when you don't want to be tracked, if you're doing something you should be doing. That's the problem. I suppose it's also the case of who is actually getting access to the data. So well, data is different. Position tracking is what you want. Data tracking is different. That's monetization of data. But I think that's a lot of what the discussion is about, is who is getting access to the information about your movements and, and what might they be using it for. There was a hand up at the front there. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I was interested in that we're all responsible adults. We're probably all making conscious decisions about turning off location data, etc. What about our children? Um, I was given a, an awareness overview to our staff and all the staff take it in, they're very, you know, I've managed to raise their levels of paranoia to <laughs> but they never click on anything. But so one of the guys came up to me afterwards and said, that's really, really useful. How do I apply that to my 14-year-old in the smartphone? It'd be interested to see what your thoughts are on that, that you've locked your house down, but what about your kids' mobile phone? <laughs> Well, yeah, so mobile phone, that, that's a bone of contention currently with the college that our son goes to. You know, you've got biometric um, authentication to, to buy food at the college. You know, it, I was dead against that. Why would an 11 year old need to give over biometric data? What if that gets breached? Where's that going to end up? Who knows? So the, we have some big concerns as parents, and you know, rightfully so as well, because it seems sometimes that the people who are actually in charge and managing this data they're getting breached every day and then they don't actually understand the, the, the uh, potential damage it can cause if you lose that data. Um, going on to mobile phones, the, the, the colleges um, issue a, a, homework, a homework app, so it's constantly on the phone to check on the homework, submit homework, etc. So I think without a smartphone, believe it or not, a 12 year old son would not really get on very well at school and that's a real, it, it, it disturbed me because, you know, this is, <coughs> You know, we're supposed to nurture our children and that, but they're just being forced down this technical route and um, I feel quite angry that this is the way we have to go. We can't, you can't, um, lots of things you have to do, you need a Facebook account, I don't want a Facebook account, tell me when hockey's on, I don't want to know it's cancelled this morning because of ice, you know, tell me, phone me, why don't people use the old communication methods, that, it drives me a bit crazy, <laughs> um, but no, I, Locking phones down is, is obviously under, under our wing and the company, you know, what we operate and how we, how we uh, deliver compliance, etc. We try and embed as much of our knowledge to him as well. And, you know, we've seen him talking to his friends about strong passwords and locking phones and making sure they switch, you know, that the screen locks, etc. and they're away from the phones now. So it's, 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 a, it's going to be a battle. And I know as it's going to get older, we're already talking about Instagram and all, you know, it's just, some of the crazy things that we're going to have going forward is going to be, it's going to be a challenge and uh, it's not going to get easier, so I'm not, you know, not looking forward to that. And, and it is something really, it's beyond your control. Um, there was a talk a couple of years ago we had from uh, the then lead of the South West Mutual Crime Unit. The, he said when he joined the unit, the first thing he did to the researchers was say to them, I don't have any profile on social media whatsoever, see what you can find out about him. Um, but ironically, people that he knew, had and they tagged and 
you can build up a picture about someone even though they don't have any technology or social media. So that is the concern, it's all the people around you. Um, just to, I think we're kind of leading into question two a little bit here. I don't want to rush you here, Chair, but there you go. Um, <laughs> but it's just a <laughs> question. Uh, um, there, there's two sides of it, really. First of all, the, the quality of, of critical education around digital literacy is all really wonderful. So, um, so children don't really get the, the faculty to judge you. But on, on the one hand, we as adults are going to be concerned about what young people are doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other hand, we're telling them to give up their privacy because we want to ensure them, ourselves that they're safe. That's a real interesting juxtaposition in terms of the erosion of children's rights in terms of you know, justifying it as a result. But, um, we're, we're concerned about you. We need to look at your phone. We need to see where you go. I mean, you know, I was talking to a preschool worker uh, a while back and she went, oh, really weird experience. Said, What's that? Mum came to pick up a kid and said, oh, disappointed you didn't take him outside until 11 today. Well, I hope she know that because she's got a trackable wristband. So, so the, the mum sticks a trackable wristband on the kid before they're dropped off to preschool and then goes home and watches the kid on the screen. You know, it's kind of like, really? Seriously? Um, uh, yeah, um, you know, but you look at the advertisers of these sorts of things and reassure yourself that your child is safe. Um, I, I had a conversation a while ago where um, a friend of mine's friend was in a difficult situation because they discovered their daughter was around her boyfriend's house rather than her friend's house, but they didn't know what to do about it. Well, why don't they know what to do about it? Because she doesn't realise that she's being tracked by them. But they wanted to maintain this, this veneer of tracking because they thought if, if we tell her off, she's going to know we're tracking her and we want to keep tracking her. That's a really concerning conversation. You know? I mean, I must be annoyed when I go into schools because I talk to young people about their rights, and I think they then have difficult conversations with teachers and parents and things. But you ought to feel sorry for my kids as well because they have the other end of it. They have the, the horribly horrific blunt questions and things as well. Um, but we won't go into that now. I think many people feel sorry for your children. <laughs> um, okay, so as Andy mentioned, there is another question on the list which is probably timely to bring on to. So who ought to define the line between acceptable use and infringement? And sort of linked to that, we heard a bit about consent being mentioned already. Has it become too complicated for users to give informed consent? Um, well, of course, government should define it. However, I have no confidence that this government could possibly define anything effective around IT legislation at all. If we have a wonderful example of the, the Damien Green pornography scandal a while ago, where he claimed he wasn't looking at pornography even though the copy that scanned his computer went, well, either someone was sat on your lap doing it, or you were definitely looking at porn, and MPs came to his defence and said, oh no, anyone can access my laptop, it's fine, you know, all the interns in my office, everyone can access my laptop, just as the Data Protection Act was being debated in Parliament. Um, just, yeah. Um, I spend quite a lot of time in that environment, and I have no confidence whatsoever that they have the requisite knowledge to actually define effective IT legislation. As we're probably aware, age verification on pornography sites is coming very soon. We're waiting for the announcement now, because that's going to stop children looking at pornography. And then you go, what about proxy? And we go, oh yeah, we hear about that quite a lot. And then, then you get the criticism, well, you tech people are really negative about this. You keep on saying it's not going to work. We're not being difficult. It's because we know it's not going to work. <laughs> However, there is a Conservative Party manifesto commitment that was, was that declared that they were going to make the internet the safest place to go online in the world, and they were going to stop children looking at pornography. So they passed this legislation, and the BBFC, the regulator, the BBFC asked for a specific legislative change so they weren't responsible for failures in that regulation, because the BBFC knows it's not going to work as well. But it doesn't matter, because we have to have a verification, because it was in the Conservative Party Manifesto. And I should stress as well, it's not a party specific issue, they were equally crap at this in their day. <laughs> Am I a camera? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll jump in and ask Andy a question. You shouldn't believe what you read in manifestos, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I hear they're entirely non committal. <laughs> well, the more you read in a manifesto, the more you should disbelieve. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think moving on from that. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm sorry, there has to be legislation and um, GDPR is halfway between what we'll be doing um, in the 90s and what Estonia does now, where as a citizen you can log on to a portal to see exactly 
um, who owns information on you, who in that organisation is actually looking at it, and they can make an informed decision. And at the end of the day, it's the person who's the data subject who needs to be making that informed decision. Um, but it has become too complicated. Too complicated. You just have to go to any website you've not been to before, and the pop-ups that you get asking, do you consent to this? Um, some of them don't do it in, <clears throat> in any coherent way. Um, they've made it really difficult um, for you to give consent for anything, really. Um, so, yes, it has been too, too far too difficult, because you don't really know who's got your information, what they're doing with it, and who they're sharing with it. Just, I agree with both of those points, and I think the only thing to add really is, um, <clears throat> is, a, is a level of trust. I don't think, um, certainly for me, the, the trust involved, you, you may um, accept it, uh, admit to um, acceptable use of your data, but I think that the gut reasoning behind my decisions are I don't trust these big organisations now to actually do what, what I'm asking them to do. So <coughs> it's all about trust. I think we should, John, say yeah, the data subject should be the person in control of their own data and who, get, who gets to use it and, and see it. So, yeah, so it's a big trust thing. And, and, and there's one, one of the biggest data collectors in the country, I'm not going to name them really massive uh, company that's got millions and millions of people's data um, and they've been collected for years for marketing purposes on their website it actually says our database is too big for us to get consent because no one's just going to come and use it <laughs> they don't actually use that wording but that's effectively what they're saying um, and that's a concern when companies like that that have built a business model on making money out of people's data um, they're taking a business risk on not telling people um, just to I think the flip side to it as well is back to education. Um, I don't know whether anyone in this room had effective education around data and consent and how digital rights and things when they were at school. Um, I don't think it exists yet. Uh, my son is currently doing computer science GCSE. He was playing one of the many videos he looked through the other day and it was about security and I was like, okay, no, that's wrong. So that's wrong. Um, but obviously you can't say that because those are the facts that are tested on. Um, but I just think by way of amusing illustration of current government capabilities around this issue. I don't know if anyone is from North Cornwall, but our MP last week suggested the solution to knife problem to put GPS trackers in the hand of knives. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions from the floor at this stage? Yeah, a question over there. Ah, yes, go ahead. Isn't it worth accepting the fact that we want free stuff, the services we use, the fact that we accept we're the product, so these companies are going to profile us, uh, they aren't going to sell on our data. Yeah, regardless of what it says in the privacy policy, they'll share it with third parties, whoever they are. And they'll just carry on collecting that data regardless. And even when you delete your Facebook profile or something else, they've got you so finely fingerprinted, even if you're not authenticated on any, on any website you go to where it's got that, those buttons at the bottom of Facebook and Gmail and that sort of stuff, they're tracking you. And they've fingerprinted your machine, they already know you are. Carry on. So it's just accepted. If you want free stuff, you're going to get your product. Yeah, I completely agree. There is something that goes around Facebook occasionally. I don't know if anyone's seen one recently. Uh, I Facebook are going to start charging, or Facebook are going to start doing this. I don't agree with it, but Facebook are going to start charging for what we do. We give them far more valuable stuff than our money, which is our information. And we, we absolutely do accept it. Um, but that goes back to whether we're capable of informed consent anymore. Um, which I think does present some interesting questions. And then there is a right way around profiling. You can actually deliberately spend that whole day a week searching for things you're not actually interested in. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd like to take this conversation, if I may, a little bit further on, actually. Is modifying behaviour of people, as we've seen it with elections, where you social engineer a specific response, so you can modify mass behavior through social engineering. Mm -hmm. And I don't think location services per se, uh, I think profiling and prediction of what's going to happen when you put some messages out onto social media or onto the media channels, which could be fake news, but it's purpose. And I don't think we're capable of filtering fake from reality and psychologically resisting behavioural change messages. 
So I think that's going to be the big problem for us in the future. Hmm. I think I very much agree with that. It's interesting that when the Cambridge Analytica story broke, it was almost like a step too far yeah. uh, on that psychological profiling as they're, they're trying to make us do things we, we don't want to do. But interestingly, a lot of people's response to that is, there's no way I'm influenced by this. And you, you look at the third person effects hypothesis where, for example, um, violent um, games or something, most people will go, no, I'm all right to play them, but I don't think other people should play because they're going to be affected because we believe we're, we're, we're not capable of being influenced in that way. But yes, I completely agree. It's, it's the, it was very much the, the thing that really got into the public debate was, hang on a minute, they're not just getting us to buy things, they're telling us how to think. Um, right. But you know, you, the government's got the behavioural support unit, which has been doing that for quite a long time as well. Um, if you notice in hotels these days, it rarely says, would you like to recycle your hotels? It says things like 80% of our guests recycle their hotels. Would you like to? And we are oh, well, one of these things, one of the lovely people, not one of the nasty people who don't care about the environment, I'll recycle my hotels. So, you know, it's the psychologists we should be blaming. That's a facetious comment, by the way. Do you recycle your hotels? No, I pay my quid for that room. They it's got away likely. <laughs> yes, uh, um, I'd like to say, uh, you know, in countries like China, where they have profiling of their citizens, mass profiling, where they would collect the data and using their social medias like WeChat and Weibo and stuff, and then they will create a public uh, social credit score. And depending on your credit score, is where you can take a loan out, where you can go to school, trains, flights, tickets. That's like the next step for us. That's where I believe we're going to go, unless we do something like public distributed uh, social media, that's something called BitTorrent, where instead of all your data being in the Facebook database, it's on everyone else's computers encrypted, so you can't access it. Like cryptocurrency was replacing the banks. Um, I think that we're not having the same way as China personally. I mean, China's got a, it's been a communist country for the last 70 years or so, and that's part of their culture and people accept it. Whereas I think we started introducing that into countries in the West and it will be rejected. But um, what you're saying about distributed data, that's how it actually works in Estonia. They've got their data, it's distributed all over the place and it's linked into one central portal. Um, so they don't have the data in one place. And that's the only way you're going to be able to achieve that type of thing anyway. Um, because the day, days when we get every single piece of data into one database um, for everyone. Um, it's, it's going to be a, a triumph of political, uh, breaking down political barriers, um, changing the attitude of all IT departments effectively if they um, agree to that type of thing, they'll be putting themselves out of business because there'll just be one. And um, people's behaviours <coughs> and attitudes towards those one databases. So we'll never end up in a situation with everything in one big database. Question behind. So just on that, just it might not happen in the same way it is happening with China, but there's a mechanism that's cashless data. So if you look at what happened with um, uh, in the States when Zuckerberg and those guys are brought in front of whoever and they're being asked all these questions. But people making decisions fundamentally don't seem to understand the technology, they don't understand the questions they're asking, they don't understand what to get to. So just because we don't see it happening in the same way as China where we're, we're directly going that route, doesn't mean that we're not being heard of that way. You know, if it came to the analytic thing, how many people stopped using Facebook after that? Mm. How many people, you know, Facebook is in a massive term. People are sort of sleepwalking to give their data away. These organisations aren't being transparent or purposely being complex. But there's two sides. One is you become a prepper and you discuss everything. And you embrace um, that you have to give some of your data for some of your freedom to have access to the convenience. Where's that middle line? Where do we get to a point where we have a bit of control over it? Um, I mean, one thing I did see after the Cambridge Analytica thing was a drop in people doing the stupid little survey things <laughs> that were, were harvesting the information. I did see a big drop in that. Um, but yeah, we're not going to go anywhere, I can't envisage in my lifetime, going anywhere near as um, China of having a social score for every individual um, unless there's um, mass buy into it. On with you, James, on that one. Um, I, I think we are being led down the path a little bit. I think we are over-consenting or, or not 
being able to control that consent and it is heading towards the biggest power that's winning with that data, you know, the power that the companies hold with that data and the, and the, and the changes that can make, not only political changes, but all, all the you know, critical national infrastructure changes, but the whole raft of stuff that, that they're using against ourselves. And, and I think you know, it, it is a problem. And I think um, and I think we are heading, not so obviously, but in, uh, you know, quietly, it's, it's, it's a silent killer almost. Uh, it's a killer not in that context, but it's a silent sort of um, force that's underlying what's actually happening. And um, I think you know we need to be um, get a get a rust of it, I think, before it gets way out of control. But um, lots of things that we see already, um, just getting credit, for example, you know, you, you, the whole uh, financial history of the individuals is looked at, you know, looking, even to the point of what street do you live on, how many debtors do you have on the street, what's the rate, you know, there's all sorts of things being included now in just simple things like this. So, which is great because there's a lot more data available to, to do a proper analysis on, on that person at that particular time. but. It is a very, very uh, fine line between overstepping that mark and, and then creating this state of uh, good and bad. Really, it's, it's quite a worrying thought, definitely. Um, I'm afraid I don't share your confidence that we won't walk into something like um, Chinese censorship or whatever, John. Um, it, all it takes is for us to be convinced it's a good thing. Um, but then, if anyone's aware of the um, theory of the four horsemen of the infant apocalypse. Can anyone say that? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just in my head, I think. Um, the, the Four Horsemen of the Infopocalypse was a, a theory purported by a, an American computer scientist in the 90s, saying, well, going back to much theory of things, if governments wish to um, enforce stronger tech policy, they convince you that this technology is used by other paedophiles, organised crime, terrorists, or drug dealers, um, and then you get sold it. Um, so after the Westminster Bridge attack in London, um, it, we were then told that um, the guy was communicating on WhatsApp and that was encrypted and therefore we couldn't um, decrypt those messages. I mean, this was after and Rob, she was Home Secretary the first time, right? Um, was stating that um, she can't see any reason why an ordinary citizen would want to use encryption. Um, <laughs> now, you mix those two messages together, it's like, oh, do you want the encryption? Yeah, I do, but terrorists use encryption. Do you want encryption? Well, I don't want to be associated with terrorists or all. Peter Files use that sort of thing as well. Um, if we look at where we're going with, with internet filtering and stuff in the UK, we have obviously filters that, that across the legal content. I work with the you know, rights group, even the most um, extreme internet libertarian would probably not argue against the Internet Watch Foundation's um, watch list of sites that serve up job use material. However, we now have um, other organisations like the, the Counter Terrorist Internet Referral Unit, which has an entirely opaque list of if they decide when something's terrorist material, it goes on that list. Um, you don't know whether your site is on that list. Um, one person's terrorist material and another person's freedom fighter. And bear in mind that we refer to Nelson Mandela as a terrorist through the 80s in this country. Um, so, you know, you, if you've got illegal content, great. If we start to erode through, through legal content, then that starts to become more concerning because who defines these sorts of things? Well, our legislators. And I think we've already established without much confidence that, that they have the sufficient knowledge to understand these things effectively. Um, and obviously you don't win the Daily Mail over by saying this is complicated, we need to have uh, informed policy to back around this. You win the Daily Mail over by saying we need to stop people looking at this. Any more questions in the room? So while I think about it, on the issues of uh, well, both tracking and the social score stuff, if you don't watch Black Mirror, there's a couple of good episodes of that that, uh, <laughs> that, that dramatise the potential effects. Okay, let's move things on because I feel we've not heard enough about GDPR. Really. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, so let's have a question with that in mind. So has GDPR ended up confusing the situation? Thinking about businesses and organisations particularly, perhaps leaving them unsure and overcautious about what they can now do with data that they hold and things that they are able to access. Well, no one's jumping to answer this one. <laughs> um, John, that's one. Oh, do you want to go first? Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't think GDPR has confused the situation. As someone who's worked in global authority for quite a number of years, a lot of the things that companies are having to do now, we've had to do for the last 20 years, and all it's done is, is apply those same principles to private industry and various other organisations. 
Um, what has confused the situation is the way people have applied it. Um, and it, it's been inconsistent. That I've seen lots of really bad advice. And um, we're still in the learning curve about GPR. There's still case law that needs to be decided and um, clarify some certain aspects. And um, I think as a nation, our focus has been on other things in the last year. Um, <laughs> So um, it probably hasn't had the focus it, it probably deserved um, in the last year, but um, definitely in the next couple of years and moving forward, we'll see greater clarity around GDPR and improved ways of um, complying with it. Um, but are the businesses are cautious? Some businesses are, some businesses are not. The company I quoted that basically said, um, we've got this database, we don't care, um, they're definitely not, definitely not being overcautious, they've taken a risk-based decision on, um, they know they're not compliant, and they'll come on and generate the money they can until they get told not to. Um, one thing that has caused issues is the lack of resources within the ICO. Yeah. Um, uh, I know there was a conference where the ICO themselves stood up and said um, our biggest problem is our staff are being pinched by all the companies that now need data protection officers because those companies are offering twice as much as um, they're paying. So there's a lack of people able to administer it and provide um, advice over GDPR but um, it will get clearer over the next few years and hopefully a lot better um, data protection and Transparency for people. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I very much agree. I, I think GDPR is great. Um, mainly because it gives us some data rights, or it gives us some rights to actually challenge organisations on what they do with it, with our data, because it is our data at the end of the day. Um, I completely agree with John. It's generally down to poor understanding of it and um, and panic and not effective preparation. I mean, it, they didn't make it a secret. It was coming, did they? And all of, you know, two weeks before everyone goes. I'm just going to do something about GDPR. Um, you know, it's 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 fairly well known that organisations sometimes do daft things with data. Um, just to, to use a, an example for myself, I, mean, I must be a paid as an employee anyway, but, but someone in, in my faculty the other day shared a list of people who hadn't done the online training. You know the online training was supposed to do, Steve? What's that? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but he shared that list with um, uh, all heads of school, heads of schools administrators, and the dean, um, a couple of business managers and a couple of senior registrars. Um, as I pointed out to him, I consider that to be sensitive personal de uh, data about my professional development. I hadn't consented to that being shared with those individuals. And um, yeah, I got a one line email back saying thank you for raising these concerns. We'll make sure we don't do it again. Um, but, but really, yeah, you know, without the, the, the backing of better data rights, you know, it would be a more difficult thing to challenge. But this is stuff that companies are very happy to share. Um, it's kind of interesting with Morrison at the moment, you know, because an employee leaked a huge amount of data there and was locked up for it, but then the victim that breached went to court and the court has decided that Morrison were vicariously liable for that because they didn't make sure the data couldn't be breached. That could be an interesting one when you were talking about the case law coming out, John, and that could be an interesting one when we see the size of that fine. And sorry to interrupt, that this would be an opportune time to um, stick my hand up and apologise to in the room for when I sent out the joining instructions. And didn't mind probably Thanks for admitting it. I wasn't going to mention that. Yeah, I, I think GDPR is certainly focused on a lot of organisations in terms of what data they actually hold and, and how, they, they, how they handle it and, and interact with other organisations. I remember around the end of March this time last year, working with a client, sitting down at his desktop with him, working through, a, a, he just had a payment card breach, so working through that, and he had a little yellow post-it note on his monitor, next to his password post-it note, <laughs> which, um, which said GDPR, and I said, oh, by the way, what are you doing about GDPR? He goes, oh, that's, coming, that's following the car breach incident, we're going to go through GDPR, and we go, okay. So it has been <laughs> just combined with a lot of organisations that we work with. Um, and I think it's true to say that a lot of them have overcomplicated, uh, overcomplicated it themselves. Um, we know from the ICO that there's been an awful amount of um, over-reporting. <laughs> Everyone goes into panic mode. Oh my God, I've sent an email to six people that shouldn't have, you know, friendly ICO is within 72 hours. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of over-reporting. And I think 
the next uh, few months and years, you know, that will all calm down a bit and we'll, we'll all take a check. But the, the, the real beauty and benefit that's come out of all this, and John mentioned it, a lot of organisations actually do this with data anyway. It's just um, edifying and emphasising to, to the wider community that, you know, we should take care of this data a bit more protectively. And please can you delete that email? I'm going to send it around. <laughs> Still, I think this is represents uh, Fiona Bruce's question time. So to ask a topical question in the mould of question time chaired by Fiona Bruce, can I yeah, ask yeah. you, is a no deal Brexit going to cause a change to GDPR? Um, not if we want to trade with Europe. No deal Brexit. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if, if, if we go out with a no deal Brexit and then go, oh, Europe, can we still trade with you? They go, what are you GDPR compliant? And we'll go, oh, shit, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we started, but we didn't finish. <laughs> well, you know, my concern would be that GDPR arguably is effective because it was developed in Europe, not as a UK independent piece of legislation. And my concern would be that we'll have poorer and poorer data protection rights and things as a result of. Not having that influence. And our Data Protection Act actually enforces it in yeah. and still UK law, so. But well, it hasn't yet been passed. No, it has. Yeah. 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 No, no, Data Protection Act. Yeah. Yes. You know, the state and general agree with you, the scope of GDPR is global, not European. <laughs> It should, it, it should be global, but um, some company, uh, countries pay um, less um, attention to that sort of detail around data protection. <laughs> any more for any more questions in the room? I'm looking at, oh yes, it's up front now. I'm just going to say, I think one of the nice things that came out of GDPR is it forced some of the kind of US suppliers and things to yeah. kind of think about where their data centres were because they wanted to continue to do business with with um, people in Europe, so we're seeing a lot more suppliers offering EU data centres that put GDPR compliant policies, whereas before it was somewhat less than transparent, so I think that's something that's beneficial that came out of it. And I think that's been a, a massive business enabler for them as well, and taken a all by all and actually created these European data centres and take home their own kids and all the boxes with, with that, so they've definitely seen an opportunity there and, and they're running with it, so yeah, good on I think also that illustrates what happens with an ideal Brexit. US companies are generally, or well, US government arguably as well, are generally less um, um, concerned about data abuse and things. However, I mean, they used to just argue safe harbour the whole time and still some people went, actually, that doesn't work. Um, but GDPR came along. I, I know a data protection lawyer who made an absolute fortune in the last three years advising US companies on GDPR compliance because it was involved in their business models. And I pulled up next to his one eight plate Range Rover the other day, and he really had made a lot of money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Looking around for more questions in the room. Okay, so a last question to the panel in that case. So, given what we've talked about and all the debate we've had, is technology worth the trade offs? Yes, I don't think I can deliver that smartphone these days because it provides so much um, information and, and value at the top of my finger. And I'm prepared to <clears throat> allow it to do certain things as long as we control them and uh, yeah, make, sure, <coughs> excuse me, make sure the likes of Strava isn't tracking me from house and letting people who you can see that on Strava find out exactly where I live and um, what times I'm not going to be home. Um, so in, in some aspects, yes, it is. Worth the trade off. We wouldn't have smartphones if you didn't think it was. Very good. Not. Peter. I'd say yes, and I'll include technology, <clears throat> um, anonymised data for use in research, etc. I think that, that's a, it's definitely worth the trade off in my, in my mind. Um, what, what can be achieved with um, advancing um, treatments and, and research in med just medical science <coughs> alone, you know, so I think definitely worth the trade off. <coughs> and finally. Um, I'd say yes for now, um, but we do seem to be sleepwalking into some fairly poor um, policy around this area and accepting of it as well. 
Um, and we definitely don't have the education for, for the next generation coming along the world. One of the funniest things I do with, with young people is ask them if privacy is important to them. They say no, they don't care about privacy. Um, they haven't got anything they don't care for get hacked. And then I go, can I have a look at your mobile phone? And they go, no, I'm fucking off, that's why. So, <laughs> um, but, but, you know, because we don't have critical education around these issues, I kind of fear we are going to get into a, a sort of like two tier. Um, Society, really, those of us who can actually understand about these sorts of things and, and you know, the, the very tech savvy people um, will be able to, to manage and protect their privacy, whereas most people accept the if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, and keep on sharing. But I think the, the government interference is probably more concerning to me than, than private sector interference because it's more opaque. And finally to you, ladies and gentlemen, hands up if technology is worth the trade-offs to you. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, if you would join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>